Don, we're really going to take some time and get into how to optimize dietary protein. But I think before we get to that, it's important to talk about why. So for somebody right now who is eating a healthy diet, they feel like, okay, I don't really need to learn about protein. You know, I'm getting an adequate amount, whatever that is. Why do we need to look at optimizing that, especially as we're aging? Yeah, I think one of the facts I always like to start with with people is we usually think of children as needing protein because they're growing. So obviously you're building new muscle mass, you're growing lean body mass, but the actual amount of new protein, the net new protein a child lays down per day is only about five grams. Very small amount. But whether you're 16 or whether you're 65, you have to build 250 to 300 grams of new protein just to replace and repair what you already have. And what really makes that unique then is that when you're young, when you're a 20-year-old, you're heavily protected by your hormones. But when you're 65, the efficiency of the process goes down. And so now your diet has your diet and your exercise need to be much more specific uh and what we know is the efficiency of your protein goes down so you need more so that's kind of the underlying fact is that whether we're talking about muscle health or bone health you're constantly replacing and repairing that and that has to change uh, i like to tell people that every year you replace the equivalent of every protein in your body about four times. And how well you do that determines a lot about how you age. So from hearing you talk there, this becomes more of something to consider as we get older. I think you mentioned the age 20 or 20 something where before that hormones take care of things. So what age specifically does somebody really need to get this in line and start taking care of the dietary protein? You know, that's not something that we can draw a line and say it's exactly 31, but the transition is occurring between 30 and 40. We know everybody who looks at aging sort of puts 40 as a sign of where it starts downward. <laughs> and what we want to do is control that, you know, the slope of that curve. Uh, we know in the 20s, there's a lot of studies on 25, 26 year old. We know that their efficiency of protein use is very different than older. Uh, a colleague of mine, Doug Patton Jones, and I did studies with 35-year-olds. So we know the transition has occurred. We know that the, the body, the muscle is more sensitive to how, you, how much protein and how you distribute it. So I usually tell people by 30, you need to be making transitions. So for somebody tuning into this and say they're 21 and they have a jump on things, they're saying to themselves, does it really matter at this age? I'm assuming it does because, you know, hormones like you talked about are going to help take care of things. But for somebody who has young children or somebody who is younger tuning into this, what would the difference be between somebody who is just eating what they consider a healthy diet, you know, whole foods and not really considering protein versus somebody who does what we're going to get into? Well, if you take the extreme case, when I was early in my career, I did a fair amount of research in Africa with malnutrition. And one of the things that we see is that with lack of protein in children, they don't develop appropriate muscle mass. And so they then end up being excess fat. So we're seeing a lot more obesity now in children in the United States as we've shifted away our thinking from protein thinking about more plant-based protein, children aren't developing their muscle mass correctly. Uh, India is a prime example where they just don't have the protein available to them, and they're what we call skinny fat. They look fairly lean, but they have no muscle mass. Uh, and they're, I think, the number two country in the world now for diabetes, even though they look skinny. So, you know, as a 20-year-old, your, your question uh, you still need to be developing your muscle correctly because that sort of sets your plateau. We People have always talked about developing your bone so it's healthy when you get the 40 because it's got, you're going to lose some as you age. Well, muscle is exactly the same. What you want is a good foundation when you get to midlife because it's, it's pretty easy to develop muscle 
into your mid thirties, it's much, much more difficult to develop muscle when you're 55. Well, let's get into the nuance of that a little bit and talk about somebody who might be, you know, in their mid fifties tuning into this and they've been neglectful with consuming, optimizing their protein intake and, and doing resistance training and building up their muscle. If they haven't been focusing on that to this point, how much rebuilding can they do? Or is it just about maintaining what they have? They can definitely rebuild. Uh, but we would certainly start with you need to maintain what you have. Uh, uh, we, we, we want the downward trajectory to stop is the first step. And then, you know, depending on how much work you're willing to put in, we know that muscle accumulation uh, really at any age, but certainly at a 55 year old relates to resistance exercise. Uh, so if you're really looking to build muscle, you're going to have to probably you're going to have to do resistance exercise with fairly heavy weights uh, to actually build. So, you know, big difference between maintaining and actually trying to build. Uh, protein is a little different. Uh, we know that too little protein will cause you to lose muscle or prevent you from gaining, but extraordinarily high amounts of protein won't cause you to gain more. Uh, so unlike resistance exercise, the more the better, Protein's not necessarily the same. The same. So we we know that the sort of strike zone for protein uh, is somewhere between 1.2 and 1.8 grams per kg, which is about 0.5 to 0.8 grams per pound. Uh, which is interesting because the the recommended dietary allowance, the minimum that people talk about, is 0.8 grams. So we're we're talking double. The, that minimum RDA for an adult. Well, while we're on the RDA, let's talk about where that number comes from. And for somebody who's been relying on that as their goal to this point, what does that mean for their, their protein intake and, and their muscle health? Let's start with an example that's not protein. So some people can kind of come to grips with it. Let's talk about vitamin C. The RDA is designed to be the minimum to prevent a deficiency. So for vitamin C, the deficiency is called scurvy, and the requirement is 60 milligrams per day. People during COVID or during a winter cold season will take 1,000 milligrams because they think it optimizes their health, their immune response. So we now have the difference between a minimum and an optimum. So let's take the same thinking into protein. The minimum is 0.8 grams per kg. The deficiency, you know, protein calorie malnutrition is a little harder to define. And so the way it's measured is what's called nitrogen balance. And it's done in 25-year-old males eating a pure animal protein diet that are healthy and active. So, so the question is, that's the minimum for who, you know? 5% of the population, uh, you know, and everybody else needs more. So what it is, is a minimum. And what we know is we don't see quashi or courage or, or, or marasmus. We don't see pure deficiencies at the RDA. But the question is, does that lead to healthy aging? And there's a lot of data now that we're pretty sure it doesn't. We need more than that. And if you look at the research, if you look at values of 0.8 grams per kg versus something above one, you can always see a benefit of getting above one. So, you know, we usually tell people they need to be at least at 1.2 grams per kg, which is around 0.5, uh, 0.5 grams per pound. That's really what we consider the minimum for an adult. And let's talk about that difference between the RDA and what you'd consider the minimum in what that means for muscle quality and muscle size. So I'm assuming somebody who's not getting an adequate, according to what your adequate is, they're not going to put on as much muscle, but I'll have you elaborate on that. And then talk about the actual quality of the muscle and if there's a difference there. Aging studies are very difficult. So what we think is that in normal aging populations, so these are, you know, in the United States, that would be people eating around 0.9 grams per kg. People in the United States are eating just above the minimum. 
women are actually 40% are actually below the RDA. So the average is around 0.9. Uh, what we see is the muscle loss is about 5% per decade, something around that. So you're slowly losing muscle. Uh, a colleague of mine, again, Doug Patton Jones, uh, proposed slightly different model. What we, you and I have kind of been talking about is sort of a linear decline. As you get older, it slowly goes down. He proposed what he called the catabolic crisis model. And he says, you know, we're not, we're not laboratory animals living in sterile cages. We actually have lives. And during your, you know, from the age of 30 to the age of 80, chances are you're going to get ill. You're going to fall and break a bone. You're going to get COVID. You're going to have the flu. You're going to get whatever. You're going to have bed rest. And we know that when you're inactive, if you have bed rest, the rate of muscle loss is dramatic. Uh, adults, 65-year-olds, can lose seven to, between 7 and 15 pounds of muscle mass in, in a week to two weeks if they're bed rest. And what we know is it's nearly impossible to gain it back. You can't just go back. So what he's proposed is actually we have slow kind of downward decline, but all of a sudden we'll have an acute effect. You know, we try and do weight loss. We break something, whatever. And those are just impossible to recover from. So our earlier comment, what you need to do is sort of preempt that. You need to think ahead and realize I need to keep my muscles healthy so that I can survive whatever life presents me. Given that example of somebody becoming bedridden and starting to lose muscle mass quite quickly, if somebody's tuning into this and then they find themselves down the line in a position like that, what are things they can do to prevent or mitigate that loss? I'm assuming consuming maybe extra protein. What about passive stretching? Sure. Different things they can do if they have an acute injury and they're stuck in bed for a couple weeks. Well, first of all, the, the more physical activity you could do while you're ill is great. So most hospitals, you know, you go in for a surgery and the next morning they have you up trying to move. So people realize that being totally sedentary, being bed fast is the worst of all cases. But you're right. Higher protein is important. Um, and even amino acid supplementation can be important. So we know that the the amount of protein, the quality of the protein, and getting it in during those cases helps mitigate that loss. Uh, you know, uh, you know, I haven't done a lot of the hospital based research, but a number of other colleagues have, and it's pretty clear that if you make the right choices about protein, you can't stop the loss, but you can definitely uh, minimize it. And another situation for people that might be more practical is if somebody is say, you know, we'll give an age mid thirties, mid forties, it doesn't really matter, but an adult who is say traveling for a week and they can't do the regular workout or they can't, yeah, move their body like they usually do to maintain muscle mass and muscle health. What we're saying here for being bedridden could be applicable in that case as well. Another example, and the one that I've actually done the most research on is weight loss. Weight loss is a catabolic condition. You're trying to lose body weight. What you'd like to lose is body fat, but you can also lose lean tissue. And so what we did uh, in, in a number of uh, studies is we looked at the old food guide pyramid, which is a high carb, low protein diet in individuals who were sedentary during their weight loss. And what we showed was 35% 35 to 40% of the weight loss was actually lean tissue, muscle. But what we then showed is that if we go to twice the RDA for protein and have them do resistance exercise, and this was very mild, it was more like yoga exercise, stretch, uh, three days a week, we can reduce that lean loss to less than 5%. So basically, we could prevent it. So we think that extrapolates to uh, hospitalization, to bed rest, to aging. Uh, we, we used weight loss as sort of an acute, uh, an acute change in body composition. And we showed that protein and exercise can pretty well mitigate lean loss. Interesting. And what that gets me thinking about is 
given that research, do we know how much of that preserving effect came from the exercise versus the protein? Because I'm picturing somebody who's losing weight and maybe they're still having a high protein diet, but they're doing a lot of intermittent fasting and not moving. We could, we could interchange the variables, but what I'm getting at is how do we differentiate how much of that comes from the protein we, ingestion we actually, versus the exercise? We actually did that exact experiment published in 2005. Uh, so we, the sort of the scenario I was painting was a two by two. So we had high carb, low protein, and then high carb, low protein with exercise. And we had high protein, low carb and high protein, low carb with exercise, two by two. So we have all the possibilities. What we showed was the exercise in that case, and I'll, I'll define it a little bit more in a second. In that case, the protein effect and the exercise effect were about equal. They were additive. So they each sort of buffered that out. So if the, if the high carb, low protein, sedentary caused, for sake of argument, 40%, muscle loss, protein spared 20% of it, the exercise, the other 20%. So it's kind of equal. Um, exercise probably is the more potent of the two. But if you remember what I said, we did very light exercise. We did yoga, basically. It was stretch. So if you did more weight, the resistance exercise would probably be the dominant factor. You could probably get more bang for your buck. But we were doing this with midlife women who aren't necessarily fond of going to the gym. And so we wanted to pick, we wanted to pick realistic exercise that midlife women would be comfortable doing. So that's how we did it. So anyway, in that case, it was about 50-50. We generally say if you're looking to build muscle as an adult, the effect's probably 75% resistance and 25% protein. If you're actually looking to build, if you're actually looking to build muscle, that's probably the balance. I want to come back to something I touched on earlier and we got on a tangent, which is good, but I want to pull us back. Muscle quality for somebody who has been neglectful, making sure they're optimizing their protein intake. When you do say a biopsy or do some kind of scientific investigation of the actual quality of the muscle. Do you find given different protein intakes that changes? And why I bring this up, as you're explaining something earlier, it got me thinking about different steaks. And if a, a cow is fed grain at the end of their life versus grass fed, grass finished, with the grass fed, grass finished, there's going to be less marbling, less fat in that muscle. So I'm just wondering protein as a macro, how that changes muscle quality. Yeah, so... Um, your analogy is sort of okay, but marbling in an animal is a genetic thing that's different than in a human. So, well, that's a that's a good visual for people, but it's actually not an exact duplicate. But to your point, what we know in the the conditions called sarcopenia that as we get older and begin to lose muscle mass, we can get some fat infiltration both into the fibers and around it, you know, as fat around it. And it can look very much like, you know, a steak that has too much fat or, you know, a piece of bacon or something that has fat surrounding the muscle. So uh, that's exactly what can happen. Uh, and it usually coincides with loss of physical function. I mean, people lose activities of daily life. They can't get up out of a chair. They can't go up steps. And so they're losing strength. And they're also, uh, you know, the other aspect of it is they're losing metabolic function. One of the things, you know, my colleague, Dr. Gabrielle Lyon, and I always like to talk about is muscle-centric health, is that muscle is actually the primary tissue for insulin sensitivity, for carbohydrate, for diabetes control, for blood lipids, for fatty acid use, for your blood lipid content. So muscle is actually, I mean, it makes up around 50% of our body, certainly 50% of our protein. And it's really critical for not only functional mobility, but also metabolic health. Well, let's get more into the nuances there. That's a topic I really want to delve into. And obviously, this will be a factor for people when they 
decide that they're going to take this on or not. This is a whole nother element that I think a lot of people don't think of when it comes to putting on muscle mass. A lot of people I'm sure think of being able to move their body and to lift heavy things, but the whole metabolic aspect is a whole nother element. So let's get into the weeds there. Yeah. So, so, so muscle again, makes up a very large part of your body composition and it's a primary tissue for using carbohydrates, for example. Um, if you look at the body's use of carbohydrate, the brain uses some, the red blood use some, they're absolute glucose users, the kidney uses some. If you add that up, uh, you get a number of about 80 grams of carbohydrate per day, and they put a safety value on top of that. And so we actually have an RDA for carbohydrates of 130 grams per day. In the United States, the average carbohydrate intake is 300. So three times the RDA. So where can we put that? People say, well, you know, put it like, well, once your glycogen stores are putting, what are you going to do with it? So basically the only tissue that really can burn it is muscle. And so then we can think about how does muscle burn it? Well, it burns it with physical activity. And the range is from about 40 grams per hour up to about 70, depending on the intensity of the exercise. So if you put in an hour's worth of intense exercise every day, so we're talking heart rate above 120 type of range. If you put in an hour, you get a, you, you basically earn another 60 grams of carbohydrates per day. So now we've gone from 130 to 190, but we're still nowhere near 300. So basically, for people to justify 300 grams of carbohydrates per day, they have to put in three hours of intense exercise every day. Nobody's doing that, and that explains obesity and diabetes. We have to go no farther. <laughs> so there's two different mechanisms there that we can address. Obviously, putting carbs into the body, plus exercise, plus something you maybe were about to jump into, the fact that even on days when we're not working out, having extra muscle on the body is helpful for our metabolism besides the actual working out. So, you know, kind of filling in those blanks, uh, the primary fuel that muscle likes is fats. It prefers, its preferred fuel is fatty acids. So uh, you and I talking right now, our muscles should be burning somewhere near 80, maybe 90% is coming from fat, fatty acids. Uh, I just came back from the gym a little while ago playing tennis. Uh, that probably upped my use of carbohydrates because it's more intense. When we get above about 60%, 65% of our maximum exertion, the body has to switch over to carbohydrate use. But up till that point, if you go for a walk in the afternoon, your body should be using almost exclusively fats. So that gets us back to that carbohydrate use. You know, why do we need so much carbohydrate? The body has to either burn it or store it. Uh, carbohydrates are somewhat dangerous, actually. In fact, they have their own disease. It's called diabetes. If carbohydrates, blood like glucose, stays too high, we get damage to every organ in the body. So the body has to do something with it. Ideally, it will burn it. But if not, then it has to store it as fat. It has to convert it into fat. And we get all kinds of things. We see higher blood triglycerides. We see fatty liver. Uh, we see all of the negatives that go with diabetes because the body's now forced to convert carbohydrates into fat. And that's not a very efficient process. And the body doesn't like doing it. It, it, it complicates things. We have too much insulin required. Everything sort of starts becoming negative and inflammatory. Okay, so it sounds like what we're looking for is this balance of moderating the carbs and putting on muscle to help with metabolism, the balance between the two. Yeah, so when we teach it, uh, per, again, per particularly with people who are struggling with weight, uh, we always teach it that your protein and carbohydrates are a one-to-one -one ratio. In, in the United States right now, it's about four-to-one carbohydrate to protein. And so we're going to bring the carbohydrates down and the protein up, and we're targeting one-to-one -one ratio. If people do that, they generally find they can control their weight, and they'll also protect their muscles. 
And we're going to do it by bringing carbs down and bringing protein up. We're going to basically substitute uh, carbs out and bring, you know, replace it with protein. In the health world, when you hear people talking about upping protein in the diet, you often hear about the thermogenesis of increasing protein. And I know I've heard you debunk this myth. So let's talk about why. No, that's that is absolutely correct. Oh, there I thought you've a... debunked. I've heard you on another show talk about nuance there that is not, not totally true. <laughs> okay, then talk about not. why it is true. Well, yeah, yeah. So, so protein has a, a significantly higher thermogenic effect than either carbs or fat, for sure. So, carbs and have fat. About five percent of the energy is lost to heat thermogenesis. And with protein, it's about 20%. People have argued, and what you've probably heard me debunk is what's the mechanism behind it. That's what I'm the getting mechanism, at. Mechanism. So it, the thermogenesis is 100% true, but the mechanism is wrong. Uh, what the freshman level nutrition textbooks would say is because of digestion, absorption, and metabolism. And that's not true at all. Uh, protein. And digestion absorption doesn't really cost any more than fat or something else. What's different is that muscle is that protein stimulates muscle protein synthesis, and that is a very expensive energy process. Some people estimate that that can account for 20% of our basal metabolism if you do it correctly. Uh, I'll give you an example. One of the ways we discovered it, we were looking at uh, treadmill running at rodents. So we were using rodents as a way to study protein synthesis. We wanted a, a way to get protein synthesis to, to be inhibited really quickly. So we did exhaustive running in rats, dropped protein synthesis. And that's kind of how we discovered a lot of the meal stuff, which we can get into. But what's important about it is when we started measuring ATP, the energy and muscle with that exercise. And then we started measuring it after a protein meal, and we found that the energy expenditure of a protein meal was about the same as an hour of running. That's the thermic effect of protein. It's protein synthesis and muscle. And so if you don't eat the correct amount of protein, if you don't eat it at the right times to get muscle effects, you won't see it, which is why there's some differentiation in, in the in the literature, some people claim it's bigger or less than others. The issue is really how you eat your protein at meals. You use that term muscle protein synthesis, and it's going to be really important moving forward. So let's get into what that means. So every day, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, the body has to build something over 250 grams of new protein. And so we call that process of building it protein synthesis. So the body is taking all of these amino acids. We have 20 amino acids that make up protein. And the body assembles those into different proteins. That's the process of protein synthesis. Um, and the other half of that process is protein breakdown. So every day we're breaking down about 250 to 300 grams. So that's a cycle that we're trying to maintain. And the better we maintain it, uh, if we can keep synthesis and degradation or breakdown the same, then we can keep our muscle mass constant. In general, aging means that breakdown is a little bit higher than synthesis, so we have a slow loss. So it's a, it's a, the total process is called protein turnover and consists of the process of making protein, protein synthesis, and breakdown, breaking it down. So that's the, those are the processes. We think that synthesis is the more important. We think the body regulates everything on the synthesis side because it's much more uh, energetically expensive. Uh, the body doesn't build protein unless everything's kind of right. Uh, breakdown kind of goes on no matter what we do. And by the sounds of it, there's breakdown that's naturally happening in the body no matter what, even for the sedentary person. And then I'd assume that gets ramped up when somebody starts doing resistance training. Yes, I would go with that. So the, you know, the amount of breakdown, the exact amount um, per day, I'm not sure we've got a really good numbers to put on that. So I keep using this 250 to 300 grams per day. Uh, I can't tell you that, you know, if I'm doing a lot of resistance exercise, uh, it becomes 350. Um, 
We do know that exhaustive exercise does increase the degradation time. We do know that the body becomes more catabolic. But to put an actual number on it, uh, I've never seen anybody attempt to do that. But uh, in general, I agree that, you know, it's more during the exercise period, if it's intense, uh, it's more catabolic. But if you're just going out and saying, you know, I'm walking five blocks, that's not going to be a catabolic experience. And and people who become well-trained, uh, the exercise bout is less catabolic. So it's most catabolic in an untrained people, person who does an exhaustive exercise. The more trained you are, the less catabolic it becomes. Okay, to put that a different way then, say we have an untrained person, they do some heavy resistance training. Does muscle protein synthesis become more important than the person who's on a day off, somebody who's regularly working out, but they're on a day off? Does it become more important in that earlier case? Um, it's, it's important in both cases. What's different uh, is in the untrained person, what we've shown is that protein soon after that exercise is important for recovery. If the more trained you are, the less important it is to have it right afterwards. We showed that uh, if you're untrained and you do an exhaustive bout of exercise, you become quite catabolic. And the sooner you go into a recovery, uh, you can get back into, you know, stop losing muscle mass. Uh, you can recover from it. So uh, that untrained person, there's a lot of the research that's out there is studying that untrained person because you can get bigger effects. Uh, if you're well-trained, um, I'm not sure that protein immediately after exercise is particularly important. You go to the gym and you'll see the weightlifters carrying around bottles and drinking protein shakes and things. I, I, I hope it makes them feel better, but I'm not sure they're getting any real benefit versus just eating their next meal as high protein. It's important we get into this because this is one of the things in the resistance training world where people are, yeah, walking around the gym with their protein shakes and drinking it in between sets and after workouts. So just to make sure we're 100% clear on this then, for somebody who is untrained and maybe just beginning at the gym, that could be valuable to do that. But for somebody who has been training for years and they're fit and they're just maintaining, maybe putting on a little bit of muscle, it would be enough for them just to leave things alone after the workout and go into their next meal and get their protein through that. But the nuance I want to get into, what if, what if it's like five hours, just how long, how long of a period would they have even for the trained person before that would make a difference? I would hope after most people exercise, they're hungry before five hours, but you know, to some extent, to some extent you're right. Um, you know, I think in a well-trained individual, uh, once they sort of define their meals, they should see, keep that with regularity, you know. And so if you have meals every, you know, five hours, you know, whatever, seven, 12, seven, whatever, five, six hours, um, where are you going to put the exercise that's not within four hours of, of a meal? <laughs> you know, <laughs> where are you going to do it? <laughs> uh, you know, I, I just think it's not that important. Uh, if people who are actually trying to gain muscle mass, they will often try to increase their total protein. So we talked about a range, but a lot of those kind of people will go up to uh, you know, a gram per pound or maybe even higher. Uh, then the question is, what's the efficiency of a meal? We know there's a, a beneficial range of a meal of about 30 to 55 grams of protein. Uh, if you get above that, the body doesn't really use it very well. It becomes less efficient. And so now if you're trying to get in 200 grams of protein, say you're six, you know, you're six foot five and you weigh 285, where would you put it? Okay, now there's a reason to have a fourth meal. If you want to have a protein shake after your workout, that's great. If you want to do it later at night, that's great. But, you know, having more meals becomes a good choice. And after exercise is fine, but there's no magic to that. I want to come back to frequency of eating and dosage of protein, but I think it'd be helpful first to come 
come back and zoom back on this muscle protein synthesis thing. And I know a starting place for people when they come to this protein world that you like to recommend is to get that protein bolus first thing in the morning of that 30 to 55 grams of protein to stimulate muscle protein synthesis. So let's start there and talk about why that's important. And then we can get into some of these other nuances. So we've been talking about aging and I was talking about weight loss. And so it's, it's important to think about the effects of meals and also the nighttime fasting. So what we know is that the anabolic period of a meal for muscle protein synthesis is about two hours. So if you have a protein meal at seven at night, you're anabolic from seven to nine, and then you go into a catabolic period for the next 22 hours. So in that overnight period, you're breaking down muscle basically to fuel other organs. The liver in the middle of the night, I mean, a lot of the amino, a lot of the proteins in the liver only last an hour or two. They're constantly being replaced. Proteins in the blood are constantly being replaced. Uh, red blood cells, your brain cells, everything is constantly turning over, even in the middle of the night. So where do they get all the amino acids to do this? Well, the only, there's unlike body fat, which is a storage for energy, there's no storage for amino acids. So it comes from muscle. So during these nighttime periods, we're very catabolic. The muscle's breaking down, supplying amino acids so the liver can keep making protein. If the liver can't make protein in the middle of the night, you die. So it has to get it some, someplace. And so you wake up in the morning after now you've had a 12 or more hour fast, you're totally catabolic. You're breaking down muscle protein and you're going to stay that way until you eat protein and until you eat enough to stimulate muscle protein synthesis. So that's kind of how we got into it. We were studying that and we basically discovered that it takes uh, a certain amount of protein, that certain amounts around 30 grams of protein, 35 grams. And it's because of a certain amino acid called leucine, which we kind of discovered its role. Um, we can get into that whatever level you want. But basically, we want to get people out of that catabolic condition as soon as possible, get them back into making protein protein, replacing their muscle protein. And, and again, we think that in aging or in weight loss, any stress condition, that that becomes even more critical. So if you know I have an average 25-year-old who's healthy and active and eating a lot of food, chances are it's not that big of a deal. But we think the older you get, the less efficient you are, the more stress you're under, the more and more important it gets. A lot I want to get into you opened up there, starting with the fact that when we take in protein, we don't have storage for it. So we only have it in the system for a couple of hours, and then we start pulling from muscle. Really important point for us to highlight. And where that ties in as you were talking there, when we wake up, a common practice in the health and wellness space is intermittent fasting and not taking any calories in until say lunch, or some people are pushing it even further and having one meal a day or even doing longer fast multiple days. So I'm really curious on how, how you think about fasting and if it's ever beneficial or because of what we just talked about, we should be avoiding it. Yeah, um, lots of pieces. Uh, I had a couple of other thoughts come in, so now I'm thinking about too many things, but <laughs> um so again, how you answer that question depends a little on the stress you're under. Um, so, you know, if again, you're pretty healthy, your muscle mass, you're pretty active, and you want to do a time-restricted feeding, uh, I usually use the term first meal as opposed to breakfast. And so whether that first meal is at 7 in the morning or 1130, it's still the first meal. And whatever that first meal is needs to be high protein. Okay, so that kind of addresses time-restricted eating. Um, the more stress you're under, if you're trying to lose weight, if you're, you know, 65 or 70 and you're, you know, stressed, you know, more likely to be uh, losing muscle mass, you're weaker, 
I think moving it to an, you know as soon as possible in the morning becomes more and more important. I practice sort of a slightly different form of it. The purpose of intermittent intermittent fasting is to control calories. There's no magic about it. It's a way of controlling calories. Condense your eating into two meals and people seem to eat less. Okay. But you get the same effect if you just control the calories and you eat three meals a day. Uh, there's no magic to re time restricted feeding. It's just a calorie thing. So another approach to be at, that I actually practice is I tend to have my protein fairly early in the day. So I blunt that overnight effect and I basically skip the noon meal. I don't eat in the middle of the day and then I eat again late. So I'm not restricting my time, but I'm restricting my meals. So two meals close together or two meals far apart, it's still two meals. The only thing I'd push back on there is when it comes to intermittent fasting, having that eating window narrowed and keeping things, say, within a six-hour window, you're going to keep blood glucose down in the morning, keep insulin down, and keep into fat burning rather than spiking insulin, blood glucose, having even a high protein meal in the morning. And then you start that blood sugar roller coaster, even if you're eating a healthy I, diet. I, 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 I totally disagree with that. Okay. And we've, Talk about we've it. published and we've published that. So by lowering blood carbohydrates in the morning, you can avoid the insulin. But if you do what I said and get the carbohydrates protein into a one to one ratio, you won't see that. So the the satiety effects, the, the blood roller coaster effect of a high carb, low protein diet, you will mitigate that just by getting the carbs down. So we usually put a limit of carbohydrates on that breakfast meal of about 30 grams. And we will, we basically will correct metabolic syndrome. We'll take away those swings just by getting it down. So intermittent fasting may be a way of controlling it. But if you still end up with a high carb meal at dinner, you're still going to have the same problems. If you still have a high carb, low protein diet, even though you do intermittent fasting, you're still going to have the same problems. Okay. But what if we have somebody that is watching their carbs and still maintaining a, a narrow eating window? So they're eating, say, a similar Again, diet to you, but they're nearing the window. Yeah. I just want to push back I, because this I is the common, I, the common word on the street yeah. within the health and wellness the, space, the people I talk yeah. to. The research the research doesn't back that. The research doesn't back that narrowing the window is better than just uh, correcting the macronutrients. If you correct the macronutrient balance, your eating pattern, I don't I don't know of any data that says that's better. We've done we've done the experiment with three meals a day uh, repeatedly. And our data uh, basically reflects the same uh, glycemic control as you get with a keto diet or time-restricted feeding. So I think they all work as approach and people can choose it, but arguing that one approach is better than the other, the data doesn't back that. No, and that's why this is important we hash it out because a lot of people are thinking what I'm talking about. So hearing a different perspective and, and you're somebody that is knee-deep in the science. Saying, so. Yeah. I'm not saying that that approach doesn't work, but I'm saying that you can do it in other ways that are just as effective and, you know, it, it may suit your lifestyle better. I feel better having an early meal uh, and, you know, I get the same effects. All right, let's get into what that early meal looks like. You've touched on the fact that it needs to be 30 grams of protein. Leucine is a factor. So let's talk about whenever that meal is why those those both matter and then we'll get into the leucine piece and how much of that needs to be part of that 30 grams so the 30 grams really comes from the leucine issue um so so basically what we discovered was the unique role of the essential amino acid known as leucine to stimulate muscle protein synthesis it's kind of a dietary marker of a meal quality. Uh, and so what we know is that the, the average U.S. American has about 65% of their protein comes from animal proteins and 35 from plant proteins. And with that mix, 
a 30 gram protein meal will have about two and a half grams of leucine in it. So the 30 comes from a leucine number. And we know that we need about 2.5 as the minimum, three grams per, uh, uh, three grams may be better uh, of leucine to stimulate and maximize muscle protein synthesis. It's a triggering mechanism. So that's where the 30 comes from. Um, if it's since it's based on leucine, then the protein quality matters. If you're talking about a protein shake that's a whey shake uh, in the morning, 23 grams of protein is enough. If you're talking about a protein shake in the morning that is soy, it takes 33 to be a pure protein. If you're talking about a mixed meal, uh, you know, eggs and meats and breads and things, uh, probably ought to be 35 or more just to be sure you get it. Uh, and we know that while this 30 grams, so, and then there's two parts. So leucine, and we can get into the mechanism, is a triggering mechanism. It's a signal to trigger. And as soon as you trigger the mechanism, then you need all the amino acids. You need all 20. Okay, so then all the rest of the protein. We know that that meal uh, the minimum level is around 30, and you can still get benefit up to about 55 grams at the meal. When you get above that, it just seems like the muscle can't really handle more than that. It's just too much at a time. Um, people will say, well, you can't absorb more than 30 grams. Well, that's nonsense. You can absorb whatever you eat. So you can have a meal of 100 grams of protein. But it's very inefficient. The body just won't handle it very well. So what do I personally do? My breakfast uh, four or five days a week is a protein shake with about 45 grams of protein in it. And the other days when I'm more willing to cook, I'll do eggs and meats and cheeses and things like that. But, you know, when I'm, when I'm time restricted, I do a protein shake. Okay. A lot of detail there, and, and that's all very important. But... I want to make sure I get into some of the nuance to fully understand. So leucine is at the root of this and the number is two and a half or three grams we need to, to initiate muscle protein synthesis. Depending on the source of the protein, we might not need the full 30. I think you said way it was around 23, but you also said the fact that we need the 20 amino acids after we initiate anyways. So it sounds like there's no real shortcutting this by isolating leucine in a supplement and just taking that with a regular quote unquote breakfast. And the re again, the reality is we don't really have the research to exactly define that. So let me, let me give you another scenario. Uh, one of the things we've studied since leucine is a trigger and we know we can stimulate protein synthesis with just leucine. That, but it immediately, it runs for a little while, but then it will slow down or stop because you don't have the other amino acids. So then the question is, how many others do you need? Uh, we know that if you have a 15-gram protein meal and get a leucine to get up to 3 grams, you'll get a very robust muscle protein synthesis. Is that different than giving 55 grams? Probably, but we don't honestly know that. Okay. Right? We know that protein synthesis will be a little higher with 45 than it is with 15. Uh, but we don't really know the outcome. You know, if you go out, you know, if you go out four months and say, I'm doing this, what difference will we get? We don't know that. We can only know the short-term effects on protein synthesis. You gave that example there for somebody pushing it, say, all the way to 100 grams of protein within a meal and it becoming, you know, negligible, any benefit when we get way up into that range. What I think about when you talk about that, and this could be a myth, and that's why I want to get into this. People talk about too much protein being hard on the kidneys. Is there any truth to that? No evidence for that. No. So the, 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 the theory about that is that people who were studying renal failure, uh, that as you get into progressively into renal failure and you can no longer clear salts or urea from your blood, then you have to reduce those. So people on renal failure have low salt diets. 
they also have low protein diets to reduce kidney or reduce urea. Um, there's actually a pretty big argument now as that even in renal care, people who have renal damage or renal failure, at what point do you restrict it? Because as soon as you restrict protein, the kidney shrinks in size and your GFR, your glomerular filtration rate, the efficiency of the kidney goes down. So a lot of people, I mean, and it's still pretty controversial, but there are many people who are you know, nephrologists who don't believe you should reduce protein in the diet till at least stage three, if not stage four of renal failure. Uh, when the National Academy of Science in the U.S. looked at protein and kidney function, what they concluded was there's actually more evidence that a low protein diet damages the kidney than a high protein diet. So it's actually exactly the opposite of the myth that's out there. Interesting. The other comment about the 100 grams of protein, uh, we've been talking about muscle health, and there seems to be a plateau at which protein in a meal will actually benefit muscle health, and that seems to be around 55 grams. But if you actually take in 100 grams at meals, other organs will get bigger. So you'll have a bigger liver, you'll have a bigger kidney, you'll probably have a bigger GI tract. So if you just do a body composition with DEXA, uh, which is one of the main tools we use for body composition, you might say, well, this person has more lean body mass, but I'm not sure anybody would say having a bigger liver is a good idea. So anyway, 100 grams will have an effect, but it won't have an effect on muscle. Got it. And what if, have you come across any research showing that if the organs get bigger, that actually becomes a problem? Or it's just a neutral territory. It's just I've never I've never seen any problem associated with it. It's just it's it's just something that deceives the way the research is monitoring lean body mass now. People, you know, they'll monitor athletes and they'll do DEXA and they'll say, Well, he's eating, you know, X amount of protein, you know, three hundred grams per day and he's getting bigger. Well, his muscles aren't necessarily getting bigger, but his liver and kidney certainly are. So anyway, I, you know, it's just, it's a new, it's a nuance of how we measure lean body mass. And we're beginning to get new techniques using creatinine and things like that, that are going to be more muscle specific. And we're going to have a better idea of, you know, how we uh, partition fuels of the body. But uh, anyway, yeah. Uh, if you're looking for more protein as an athlete, what you need to do is partition it into more meals, not bigger meals. As you were talking about the 30 grams and the leucine piece, it got me thinking about the fact that when it comes to nutrition labels and how we look at protein as a whole, we never really talk about amino acids. We're always just talking about protein, protein, but we've already proven here and we know that there's essential and non-essential amino acids. So we know it does matter, but the food industry tends to just lump it all into protein and dismiss all the, the nuance there. Yeah. Um, you've actually just waded into the primary thing I'm working on at the moment, which is essential amino acids. So uh, I just gave a talk in Boston at the annual meeting of the American Society of Nutrition on exactly that topic. Uh, and let me, let me give your listeners a few examples of that. For example, protein on the package isn't even protein. It's a nitrogen measurement. Uh, they just go in and they do a crude nitrogen measurement. And it may not even be protein at all. It could be urea. It could be nucleic acids. It could be contaminants by melamine or something. And then they call it protein. And they call it protein by multiplying it by two point or by 6.25, which assumes that every amino acid has the same amount of nitrogen, which isn't true either. Uh, Non-essential amino acids like, uh, I believe, arginine has 32%, uh, or no, or glycine has 32%, arginine has 19%, so it's not 16% at all, where the essential amino acids, methionine has only 9, and leucine has 11. And so what we know is that the non-essential amino acids all are that, are that plant proteins always have more non-essential amino acid 
than animal proteins. So the label is distorted to look like there's more plant protein in plant protein bo you know, boxes than, than animal protein. So everything about it is distorted uh, to really confuse the consumer in many respects. And I've been arguing that anything that puts protein on the box should also have to put the nine essential amino acids on the box. And we published a paper in Journal of Nutrition just last month, actually, on that exact topic. So to make sure I'm clear on what you said there, a piece of it, that when it comes to plant-based products, what we see on the label is generally going to be a higher estimate than what's actually in the product. Yeah, totally. For, for the reasons I outlined, and there's still another one, which is bioavailability, you know, digestion absorption. If it's a plant-based protein, the digestion absorption probably no better than 70%. Uh, wheat protein, which is the predominant uh, plant protein in North America, 80% of the plant proteins consumed in the United States comes from wheat. And the digestion, uh, the absorption of wheat protein is about 40%. Okay, this is good that we're getting into this because why I want to highlight that and make sure I understood is to bring that into the whole vegan, plant-based, vegetarian conversation. So there's two different things that are not going for those that group of people, one being the label estimating too high, two being absorption, three being the fact that diet is generally going to be higher in carbohydrates and lower in protein in general. So talk about how you think about the plant-based diet being an expert in the realm of protein. So let's sort out two things. One is, you know, should people eat more broccoli and green beans and avocados and you know blueberries absolutely there's no question that uh the plants in our diet aren't very healthy the number one plant in the u.s diet is french fries the number two is tomato sauce on pizza and then number three is lettuce so do we need a more plant-based diet no we need a diet with better plants <laughs> so that's the first thing then the second thing is do we need to shift our plant protein and so we've been doing some modeling experiments uh, looking at the essential amino acids and plant-based diets. And what we know is that based on the RDA for the essential amino acids, if you get below about 50% animal protein, if you become more vegetarian, if you get below 50% of your protein coming from animal protein, you can't meet your essential amino acid requirement with the RDA. So now what we have to do is increase the amount of protein per day so a, so a vegetarian can meet their essential amino acids with beans and legumes and nuts and seeds and soy products, but they're going to have to have more protein to do it um, instead of, you know, a minimum of of average vegetarians around 65, they're probably going to need 80 plus to be sure they meet their essential amino acids. And the calories go up to the point you are making. Uh, if you're using carbohydrate-based proteins, beans, legumes, whatever, uh, the carb to protein ratio is about three to one or four to one. So you remember I said, you know, to balance this out, we will need a one to one ratio. Well, you can do that with animal proteins because they contain basically no carbs. But if you get all of it from beans, now you're fighting a four to one ratio. So to get to 100 grams of protein, you're going to have to eat 400 grams of carbs to get there. Uh, that's, that's a lot of carbs to burn off at, you know, 60 grams per hour of exercise. I guess that's where supplementing with a protein powder could be helpful. And so that's, you know, that is exactly. So if you're if you're going to be a vegetarian or certainly a vegan, uh, you probably need to commit to isolated proteins. And so now you're committing to ultra processed foods. And so if you think that's a healthier approach to life, uh, and if you think that's sort of better, uh, you can do it that way. It certainly works. But um, the science behind that becomes very iffy. I want to take us back to our muscle protein synthesis. First meal of the day, we talked about the 30 grams of protein, 
the leucine being two and a half or three grams of that. Let's follow that story along. We we got sidetracked in a good way, but I want to come back to that and talk about what happens when somebody starts the day with that as part of the breakfast. So again, we like to talk in terms of complete meal. So we want to ma- we want a balance of protein, carbohydrates, and fat. So um, you know, we can talk about if it was just protein, but let's talk about it the way I prefer. So basically, what we're doing is we want to bring in enough fuel to sort of fuel the process. We want some carbohydrates. Uh, we just think that. Uh, most people will feel better that way. Uh, in terms of the protein, we need to get the muscle protein synthesis started. So that's that two and a half to three grams of leucine, uh, somewhere around 30, 35, maybe 40 grams of protein. Uh, now we stimulate muscle protein synthesis. Uh, the, the, the whole process is fairly complex. Uh, if we look at muscle protein synthesis, this triggering process is stimulating protein synthesis is leucine dependent. Uh, muscle actually reutilizes a lot of amino acids. So we talked about synthesis and breakdown. The proteins that are breaking down, those mm-hmm. amino acids that are coming out are actually reused at a large a part. So basically, uh, about seven out of every amino acids that go back into protein in the muscle are actually being reused. We're recycling them. So we have this problem that, you know, the amount of protein we eat isn't really a very direct correlation to the affected muscle. We know that there's certain triggers. We know there's certain amounts, but it's not a one-to-one relationship in any, in any sense. Uh, let me give you another example. The, there's an essential amino acid called threonine. The primary use of threonine in the body is to build the muscle, is to build the mucin in the lining of your stomach and your intestinal tract. It's the protective layer. And the amount of threonine you bring in determines the thickness of that layer. So if you want to be a vegetarian and low threonine, low protein content, your mucin layer is thinner. You have less protection, more protein. 75% of Threonine goes for, you know, goes for mucin production and never gets into the blood. Leucine, on the other hand, isn't really metabolized in the in the gut or the liver very much, and it shows up in the blood almost exactly in proportion to what you eat it, what you ate it. And we we don't really know the evolution of that, but basically, muscle has learned to see that change in and leucine in the blood as a stimu- as a sign that the meal was adequate protein in it, and it triggers this expensive process known as protein synthesis. So, you know, it, there's a lot of interesting metabolism, which is what I actually study uh, about leucine and it's the other two branch chain amino acids, and they're very unique in muscle, and they provide a lot of interesting signals. I want to talk about the fact that and this ties into something we talked about before, that when we go to sleep at night after a couple of hours, we go into that catabolic state. So in the morning when we have that that synthesis, muscle protein synthesis, we're now flipping into an anabolic state. And where I want to go from there, and it sounds like that period only lasts a couple of hours. Is that is that true? I know we said yeah. protein's so, only around so, for a couple hours, but is that yeah. is synthesis no, taking that's place not, the whole time? That's not true. So let me correct you. Protein and amino acids are around for a long time, five, six hours. But what we have studied is that the protein synthesis actually comes back down to baseline. And there's different theories about what that is. Uh, British group, Phil Etherton called it a muscle full, something in the muscle, it just can't keep it going. So we know that amino acids are still high in the blood. We know all the signals are still positive. It should be running, but it stops, and we don't know why. My group, again, using animals, what we did was show that ATP gets de- depleted. I, you remember the thermogenesis argument earlier. Uh, basically, 
that meal burns up so much energy, ATP and the muscle, that we think it just stops. And we've looked at AMP kinase, we've looked at things like that, and all the signals suggest that we're stopping protein synthesis because the muscle's protecting its ATP supply. Again, if, if muscle gets too low on ATP, you can't move. You'll, you'll fall over in a heap on the floor. So it has to protect muscle contraction. And we think there's limits to how long it can run protein synthesis just because it burns so much ATP. And how long does protein synthesis typically last? Two hours. Two hours, got it. Two hours after a meal. We know, and we've seen it, it's been shown in a, a number of different cases, both with humans and in animals, that it runs about two hours, two and a half max uh, after a meal. Okay, so we have that period, two, two and a half hours after the protein, that muscle protein synthesis is continuing to run in the body. After that period of time, you mentioned the fact that amino acids and or protein are still in the system. If we ingest another bolus of protein at that time, can we re-stimulate it to start again a couple, like two, two and a half hours later? Or is there a period of time we have to wait no matter what we take in? In the research literature, it's referred to as a refractory period. That muscle is basically insensitive to additional protein for probably four to five hours. Uh, and so that's why you'll see all of us talking about spacing protein at four to five hours. Uh, the reality is that hasn't been studied super well. Uh, we did a little bit of research with that again in animals, uh, and we showed that if we can replace the ATP, if we can stimulate that, uh, we can make it run a little longer, uh, but nobody's really studied the second meal. Uh, you've probably heard me on podcasts say that uh, we don't know how important lunch is because nobody's ever studied it. Uh, we know that the first meal is important. We know that that last meal, dinner is important, but nobody's ever actually studied lunch. So what it, you know, when it, what's the timing for it? How much protein do you need? Is leucine important at all? We don't know those answers. So it sounds like where I want to go next, do we want to hit that, activate that again at the five and a half hour mark? And it sounds like we just don't have the research. We don't have the like research. Yeah. What I'm getting at is, do we, is more better? Like every five and a half hours while we're awake, do we want to continue to stimulate that? Or is there's it better some, to extend that out? Yeah. There's some evidence with weightlifters and bodybuilders that that's the way to go, that every four and a half to five hours, if you're really trying to maximize muscle protein synthesis, that hitting 45 grams every four and a half to five hours is the solution. And maximum muscle mass, maximum strength, there is some data to back that. Um, should it be even having 50 at breakfast and 20 at lunch and 60 at dinner and 40 before bed, is that the same as having 45? I frankly think it is. I think the total per day is important. I think the distribution, but I don't think it has to be even for muscle benefit. If you are interested in diabetes, and we talked a little about insulin and carbohydrates, if your goal is to stabilize blood sugar, then I would say your protein should be evenly distributed because you want the same metabolism at each meal. But if your focus is just muscle hypertrophy, I don't think it matters. So two different outcomes, which, and you could be after both, you'd like both, so evenly distributed. But we did the study uh, where we did an even distribution and everybody's locked onto that uh, as well. It has to be an even distribution, 30 grams at each meal. I don't think that's what the study said at all. The reason we got the benefit is we moved 60 from 60 grams at dinner, we moved it into breakfast. That's why we got the effect. It had nothing to do with what was at lunch. And when you look at a typical person having, say, that 60 grams at dinner and then having, you know, maybe skipping breakfast or having a high carb breakfast and lunch, that comes back to our whole thing about being in a catabolic state. And in that case, if you're just having that protein that stimulates once a day at dinner, you're in a catabolic state for 22 hours a day. 
I used to joke early in this research because different groups were doing different things. That there were groups out there that were feeding, you know, high carb, extremely low protein for breakfast. So they were feeding an Ornish diet for breakfast. They were feeding the zone diet for lunch and they were feeding Atkins for dinner. And it's sort of like, how can the body ever figure out the metabolism? So we like a much more even distribution. There's a number of studies also that look at what's called metabolic flexibility. And I think you mentioned it earlier. When you come out of an overnight fast, you're burning fats. And we want to keep that going as long as possible. So having that first meal as low in carbohydrate as comfortable for you, I think is good. So again, we we try and keep the carbs 20 grams or maybe less and proteins in the 40s, but never more than one to one. Uh, so we want the body to keep burning fats when it comes out of that overnight fast. But we want to stimulate you know, muscle protein synthesis and all the thermogenesis. And if you're going to have carbs, probably the best place to have them is at the dinner meal uh, where you're going into a sleep period. Uh, and it's a bigger calorie meal. You probably tolerate them more, probably more at that meal. How do you feel about insulin sensitivity and being less sensitive later in the day, though? I'd really have to think about how those experiments were run. Were they run on a format of high carbohydrate diets or were they run on on other balances? Um, You know, on the basis of of what we've seen with a low carb, high protein diet, um, we don't really see any glycemic problems with having carbs later in the day. So again, I I really have to look at studies that you know show that and see how they did it. Things like euglycemic clamps and things are totally misleading for actual diet uh, decisions. With the whole intermittent fasting craze, and this ties back to we talked about earlier having protein after a workout, there's a lot of people going into a morning workout fasted to supposedly increase fat burning. How do you feel about that? The difference between having that 30 grams of protein before that first workout versus having it right after. I see no benefit of having protein before the workout. Um, So if you're going to have protein ahead of exercise, almost everybody would recommend it be at least two hours ahead of it. So the exercise... The fuel mix and the exercise, uh, you said, you know, go into it fast and burn more fats. Um, that is totally intensity dependent. If you work out at 70% VO2 max, you're going to burn carbs. You're going to take it out of glycogen storage uh, or you're not going to be able to work out. I mean, you won't be able to sustain it because you can't go to that level with fat. So the fat fuel burning, um, I think that's okay. I frequently exercise in the morning fasted. I just don't want a lot of food in my stomach working out. But protein ahead of exercise, protein during exercise, I see no benefit to either of those. Protein after exercise, a lot of data shows benefit to that. Let's talk about the longevity piece. There's a lot of talk in the longevity world about minimizing protein to live a longer life. How do you feel about that? And for you, is there any truth or is it just about, because obviously there's the whole longevity versus quality of life. So is there any truth to it? And then is that just not what your goal is with your research and the way you live? So I totally agree with your second statement, longevity versus quality of life. We know that muscle health directly relates to quality of life. So, so being, you know, being 95 and healthy and mobile and, and metabolically healthy is far better than being 102 and frail and not getting around and being hospitalized. So, you know, I think muscle health there's a lot of data that that's a key to actual living. Um, I think the longevity thing is a lot of really bad science. It falls into two categories. Um, One is animal studies. Uh, They take mice and they put them in a 
sterile environment and they let them eat whatever they want, you know, whenever they want and see how long they live. Um, rodents in that sort of environment overeat by a huge amount. They continuously get fatter and fatter. And we know that obesity shortens lifespan. So when you start restricting calories or restricting protein, now what you're doing is preventing obesity. And so it's not really a protein effect. It's an overeating effect. At the University of Illinois, uh, our animal group considers a 40% restriction to normalize animals. And the other thing that happens when you begin to restrict an animal, they now meal feed. If you look at an animal just allowed to be in a cage for longevity, they eat 24 hours a day. You can go in and look at the contents of their stomach, and they're absorbing 24 hours a day. So they're triggering mTOR, and they're triggering these processes in every tissue in the body, the liver, the heart, the kidney, wherever, 24 hours a day. And we've been talking about we need meals. We need a stimulation of mTOR, and we want it to shut off. So we want meal distribution. And if you then start restricting the animal, they shift to meal distribution now, and all of a sudden they're healthier. So that's exactly what we expect. So I think the longevity is an artifact of how they're feeding it. And they're feeding it in a lazy way. They're just saying, oh, here, go eat, and we'll look in three years and see how it goes. Uh, that's That's not good science. The other part of it is epidemiology. And so they look and say, well, people who eat a more animal-based diet or have more protein don't live as long because they get X diseases. Well, that's really pretty bad science, too, because basically they take one food frequency. They ask a person, well, what did you eat yesterday? And then 20 years later, they look at what diseases they got. I don't know anybody in my circle of friends who eats the same thing for 20 years. So... I think it's just bad science. What we did, when I worked for the egg board for a while, and what we did was if you look at eggs in a healthy diet and do epidemiology, you conclude that eggs are relate, egg consumption is related to obesity, diabetes, and heart disease. But if you look a little closer and you look at first quartile versus fourth quartile, the people with the least amount of eggs are eating three eggs a week, and the people with the most are eating three and a half. So that means a half of egg per week is the cause of obesity, diabetes, heart disease. That makes no sense at all. So then if you start subdividing it more and you take out all the people who eat eggs at fast food restaurants versus the people who eat eggs at home, now what you find is eggs are a totally healthy part. They reduce the risk of obesity. They reduce risk of diabetes, they reduce risk of heart. So what we found now was that basically it's a lifestyle issue. If you have an unhealthy lifestyle and you're eating all of your food at fast foods, or you're eating French fries and and sodas and sugary foods and and greasy hamburgers, there's a good chance you're not going to live as well. But if you're eating good food at home, uh, protein actually is totally a positive effect. So again, Bad epidemiology, garbage in, garbage out. Bad epidemiology can tell you whatever you want uh, if you're willing to you know, misuse it. As you talk about eggs, it gets me thinking about one of the vegan documentaries. I think it might have been Game Changers comparing having an egg to having five cigarettes or something like that. So again, you have to look That at- was done by Arnold Schwarzenegger who bragged about having 20 to 30 eggs a day when he was doing body lifting. So- I think the game changer has been sufficiently debunked. In fact, Cameron, who was actually the director, uh, owns the is an investor in the only pea processing plant in the United States. So you know, one has to take it. Uh, it really wasn't a documentary; it was actually a sales pitch. We'll talk more about that. You've alluded to the bad science piece, but the fact that even when science appears to be good depending on how the study's done, who's funding it, we got to look back and make sure that there's not ulterior motives there. You know, funny pieces are odd because you have to realize in nutrition that our health organization, the National Institute of Health, requires that 
interested parties fund the research. So when I was studying the leucine effect um, and breakthrough discovery that changed how we think about protein, I sent that proposal to NIH for 10 years and they rejected it because they said, we really don't have any diseases related to protein, so it's not worth studying. I finally had to go to Kraft Foods and the National Cattlemen's Beef Association and the Dairy Council to get funding for that, which we now know leucine is the key to all of protein synthesis in muscle. So you have to look at it in terms of of the test of time. I never believe any publication on IC till it appears in two more labs, two more independent labs. When it starts showing up in muscle, I don't care who funded it the first one. I don't believe it. I don't care. I mean, one of the things I always tell students is if you go into nutrition, you have to realize you are biased. Everybody eats and nobody starts out their day saying, I'm going to have a really ugly diet, you know? And so by definition, everybody's biased. And so you have to accept that. And then you have to look for good science. And good science is done by repetition. Cholesterol was argued to be a cause of heart disease for 35 to 40 years. Bad science. It was repeated over and over. And the longer it went, the weaker the, the argument got. So we finally got rid of the requirement in 2010. Nutrition is a test of time, a test of good laboratories producing good data. So again, if I see a headline in a newspaper, I basically laugh and shrug it off. Basically, I go to the study, see who did it, and see if I can find two more labs that have done the same thing. If I know it, I totally discount it until I see it. So bias is something that people like to use to say, well, that was funded by the Dairy Council or the Egg Board, so we can't believe it. Well, we'd still have a cholesterol requirement in our diet if the Egg Board hadn't funded the cholesterol research to prove that it was nonsense. The challenge with a lot of this, too, is the fact that people are all so busy and a lot of times out of convenience and because there's some entertainment value there, too, we end up getting our nutrition info and, and dietary guidelines through documentaries like Game Changers. And when people do decide to get into the weeds and maybe get on YouTube and, and start finding some PhDs like yourself, there's so many conflicting pieces. So there's a lot there people have to sift through is what I'm getting at. Sure. It's very complex and, and, and I feel for the end user to try and sort through it. I like to try and make it as non-complex as possible. Uh, basically, we all have an absolute requirement for protein. We know it's a range. We know you can go from a minimum of 0.8 grams up to probably 2.5. Pick it. Pick what you want. Once you make a pick, now you've defined a whole lot of other things about your life. How much resistance exercise are you going to do? How, you know, what are you going to do? then everything else has to fall in place. How much energy do you need? Do you want that to be carbs or do you want it to be fat? Okay. There's nothing inherently wrong with carbs or fat. It's amounts. You know, what's the ratio? So, and you know, when we talk about plants, plants are a very important part of nutrients and fiber, but they're a pretty poor source of protein. So if you're thinking about them as a protein source, you really have to be careful. You're talking about either you know, ultra processed, you know, refined products, or you're talking about having, um, you know, six servings of, of lentils, six servings of beans, six servings of soy products per day, probably at least two of those three categories to even get close to your requirement. So, you know, I think that, you know, the old school of, you know, eat a very diet is still with us. Uh, animal proteins are an important part of the diet from a nutrient density. If you make choices, personal choices, not to have animal proteins, then you have to be much more sophisticated about your diet. You need to know a lot more about nutrients and a lot more about amino acids. And the average adult in the United States just simply doesn't have the knowledge or the food skills to do it. Fortunately, you know, most people are eating, you know, diets with 80 grams of protein per day and 65% of it's coming from animal proteins. And that's a mixture that's pretty healthy. We get along pretty well. We're eating way too many calories, so there's obesity. 
But that's not a protein issue. That's a carbohydrate issue. So we know due to hormones, coming back to what we talked about early in the conversation, make it so the protein piece is a little less relevant as people are younger, although they should still be cognizant and apply what we're saying. But where I want to go next is the other end of the spectrum. So beyond, you know, the 35, 40 year old where this becomes really relevant for the person who say 65, 70, which is around your age, I know you're in your mid seventies. How do things change when it comes to looking at muscle health as we get older? Do we need to look at modifying and including more protein? We're going to be less active. You've talked about the fact that it's almost this balancing act between our exercise resistance training and our protein intake. So if we're going to be naturally exercising less as we get older, I'm assuming we could take in more protein to balance that out. Let's get into the the later years and how this becomes applicable to people at that, that tail end. I mean, I think you characterized it pretty well. Um, you know, I, like I said, was at the gym earlier today and I still practice resistance exercise at least three times a week. So, you know, I, I think that 70 year olds can do that, you know, 80 and 90, maybe not so much, but simply body weight exercises, going up and down stairs, getting out of a chair, those kinds of things are important. What we really don't know is that, you know, is, is protein at, uh, you know, 1.4 grams per kg, okay for a 50 year old, and it should be 1.6 at a 60 year old and 1.8. At we don't know that. Uh, the research has been done basically a young person and an old person, and that old person could be 55 or 65 or 75, but we haven't done it by decades. And I'm not sure our research methods are good enough to do that, actually. Uh, there's certain aspects of the research that are still fairly crude. So um, does it get higher? Um, everything that I know is that, you know, as you get into 40s or older, 1.5, 1.6 grams per kg is a good target. And I think that's true uh, of a 75 or an 80 year old. The big difference is, is we know for 100% certainly your calorie needs go down. So where a 40-year-old might get along pretty well with 2,300 2, 2, calories per day, an 80-year-old might very well only need 1,400. So you still need 110 grams of protein in half the calories. So your nutrient density, whether you know your vitamin C, your vitamin D, all of your nutrient requirements are basically the same as far as we know when you're 80 as they were when you're 40 but you need a lot less calories. So that's the real challenge. And what we find is that most 80-year-olds just decrease their whole diet, and so they're getting a lot less protein. Well, I can see how that would become challenging, especially as somebody gets older with the current landscape of the way we eat, because even talking about eating the amount of protein we've been discussing for a 35, 40-year-old, it's going to be a dramatic change for a lot of people. And then as we get older, like you're saying here, we still need to keep that same gross amount of protein. We're going to have to lessen through the other macros. So I can imagine that would take a little bit of finessing and, and experimenting to figure out how to get that to work. It brings in the issue of shakes and things like that. So as my parents got older and I saw those exact patterns, uh, I introduced them to protein shakes. Yeah, I said, you know, well, when you're having your lunch or your breakfast or your dinner uh, here, have a shake, or at least half a shake. You know, if I'm giving them a 30 gram shake and they're having whatever, their breakfast cereal or something, and they're getting 10 or 12 grams of protein from that, if they can put 15 more grams of protein from a shake in with that meal as a drink. Uh, that's very functional. One one of the things we know is that. Uh, you know, as they get older, chewing and, you know, older individuals don't like to chew meat, you know, really dense protein. It's just harder to deal with. Um, and so, you know, things like dairy products and shakes and eggs and things become much more viable and, and you know, isolated protein. So 
as you said, it's a it's a real challenge uh, as to how to how to get you know 100 plus grams of protein into a 75 or 80 year old person. We we struggled. Our weight loss studies were predominantly women between about 28 and 65, and we it was a continuous struggle to keep the higher protein group above 100 grams per day. That w- that's a struggle. Women just all like to eat a lot of protein. And we know from the NHANE state in the United States, we know that women over 65, about 40% are below the RDA, actually below the RDA. And women under 22, between 16 and 22, it's almost 20% are below the RDA. So we know that women in general are very close to the minimum and don't have much margin for error. You've talked a little bit about how you go about eating, but can you take me through what a typical day would look like when exactly you break your fast and and what your different meals would look like? Because again, as we're talking about this, it will be such a paradigm shift for a lot of people. Like how do you how do you make up your plates? Well, again, when we teach it, and by the way, I have a website called metaboliktransformation.com. If people want to see our diets and things, they're there. Uh, so anyway, they can look at it. We also have a protein shake, which is interestingly enough, two thirds plant and one third dairy. So it's a it's a plant blend, primary plant protein shake. It's a meal replacement. Uh, how do we make it up? Uh, well, dinner is real easy. Most people, if they're going to have vegetables during the day, it's at dinner. So you've got your vegetable fruit part. Protein part, most people have a pretty identifiable protein part. And what we then do is put all the carbs into a one-to-one ratio. So if you want to have bread or if you want to have pasta or if you want to have rice, one-to-one visual relationship with the protein part. So that's a pretty easy meal to construct. Most people can get that right. How do you start the day? Uh, I have basically two approaches. One is a protein shake, which is what I have today. Um, I basically use our shake. So I have a 30 gram shake. You could do it with whey protein. Uh, I use whey protein. I usually use a yogurt. I use pick a yogurt that has 15 to 20 grams of protein in it um, and some carbs, uh, but basically uh, uh, a sugar-free yogurt uh, that becomes my base. I put the powders on it. Uh, I put blueberries on top of it. I put in some ice cubes, a little bit of milk for fluid. I blend that up, and I have a shake that you know is ready in three minutes, and it has 45 grams of protein, and it has about 300, 350 calories. So that's my breakfast. Uh, Today, I was at the gym for an hour and a half, so I came back, and actually, I haven't had any lunch today at all, (laughs) and so I'm going to dinner, and I'll have, as I described, uh, on a day I might have uh, lunch, uh, I typically would do a salad, so lots of different veggies with meats and cheese and eggs in it to get me sort of in the 20-gram range, of, but pretty low-calorie, lots of fiber and uh, 20 plus grams of protein. So that's my day. <laughs> my dinner will have 55, 55 to 60 grams of protein. My breakfast is 45 and my lunch is 20. Got it. Let's come to the other end of the spectrum. For the parents listening, myself included, I have a couple young kids. The 30 grams of protein to kick off the day doesn't really seem realistic with young kids. Again, we know they have that added benefit of the hormones at that age, but so it's much what, less. What for should kids. we shoot for with youngsters? So a huge difference between children and adults is this leucine threshold. Kids aren't sensitive to it, and so a child having ten grams of protein at breakfast will get a perfectly good muscle response, where a sixty-year-old will get none at all. Okay, the 60 year old needs 30 grams. The child probably only needs 50 grams per day. A child, you know, a a 10 year old is probably targeting about 50 grams per day. And they could get it in 10 gram doses five 
times a day. That's perfectly fine. So a child can eat in a very different pattern than an adult. One of the things that consumers and parents need to know, though, is amino acid balance. We were talking about the label, for example. So if you take a wheat cereal, uh, won't name any brands, let's say it has four grams of protein in a cup, a serving size, and on the label, it'll tell you that you should you know, put it together with six ounces of milk, and that makes a complete meal. And if you look at the amino acid, it's exactly complementary. The whey protein, the wheat protein is low in lysine, methionine, and leucine, and the milk is exactly complementary. So we now have 10 grams that's exactly complementary. But as the mother's been listening to all this plant-based stuff and she thinks she should use soy protein instead, so she now gives soy milk, which has less protein per ounce to begin with. Not Nobody really thinks about that. Uh, and then it's exactly deficient in the same amino acids that wheat's deficient in, lysine, methionine, and leucine. So now to make a wheat cereal complementary with soy milk, Take something above 20 ounces of fluid, almost a quart. Okay, so how many mothers know that when they're giving their plant protein to their child, they're creating an amino acid imbalance? Hmm. Something to think about. Yeah, so, you know, we, we have developed the concept of complementary proteins over the years. And so a roast beef sandwich, cereal with milk you know, cheese on something. Those are combining a plant and an animal protein and making a complementary mix. But when you start combining a plant and a plant, now you have to have a lot of knowledge of how to make those complementary. Just by saying this one's a legume and that one's a grain, that doesn't make them complementary. It's all about balance and ratios. And so again, you can do it, and there's vegetarians and vegans out there who are very skilled at it, but the average consumer has no clue. So coming to our theme here of muscle-centric health, we have these two big pieces, one being the dietary protein and the other being resistance training. I know we're coming up on time, but I want to end on the resistance training piece and talk about dosages and type of exercise. And we've touched on this, but I want to get into the nuance. So for somebody to get the proper stimulus to the muscle, how hard do they need to push it? And then how often do you recommend? Um, so that's all outcome based. Or is your goal to be a healthy adult or is your goal to compete in the Olympics? Uh, you know, it's sort of what's your goal in doing that. Uh, we know that from a muscle health standpoint to stimulate protein synthesis to make that more efficient. The real issue is stretch. And so yoga, Pilates will give you the baseline effect. Okay. Um, you won't get a hypertrophy that way, but you can stimulate the process. Um, there's some great work that's been done by various kinesiology groups around the country many of them, like Stu Phillips in Canada, uh, that have looked at volume of exercise. And so the issue of weights versus repetitions. And one of the things that we need to recognize is that lifting a five-pound weight 20 times has about the same effect as lifting a 50-pound weight twice. They're both 100 pounds. Okay. Uh, volume. It's volume. And so a lot of people will say, well, I can't go lift, you know, 150 pound barbells. You know, I can't do that. But they can do five pound weights at home and they can get effects. But you have to do it a lot of times. What we generally point to is, you know, pick a comfortable weight. It should feel heavy to you, but comfortable. And you need to do at least two sets of 10 to 12 reps. And that's kind of a minimum threshold. And so that's what we use. When we did the weight loss studies, we focused on stretch. So we had the women 
do eight positions on Nautilus machines with no weights. So they went through the range of motion, which gave the full range of stretch, but we didn't have them put any weights on the machine. And we got a significant exercise effect. Okay. So the first level is stretch. You need stretch and movement. The second level is you begin to get weights into it. And if you're really looking to be a muscle bound guy, then it's maximum. You want to lift maximum weights, relatively few reps, maxing your lift every time. Right, so, you know, again, it is what goal are you after? You know, the average adult, you know, isn't looking for that kind of outcome. And so, again, A, do something. You do use rubber bands at home. Do something that, you know, walk stairs. Do something. Then the next level would be worry about stretch. Do yoga. Bring some weights into it. And then you can go up from there. Uh, I like to do HIIT exercise because I want the aerobic and anaerobic at the same time. So I like to basically start out workouts with uh, doing 10 minutes of elliptical, get my heart rate up, and then I'll go lift around, I'll lift a, a series of weights. I'll do a rep, you know, a series of reps. Then I'll go back and do Stairmaster. Then I'll go do another set. Then I'll end with a treadmill or a bike or something. Uh, and so I'll end up with 30 minutes of aerobic, fairly high intensity. And each of those leads into my heart rate still up while I'm doing my lifting. That's the definition of HIIT, of HIIT type of exercise, high intensity interval training. So coming back to the muscle protein synthesis, we've gone into the detail of how to stimulate that through diet. I just want to end on giving you a hypothetical situation. Say somebody's in a fasted state, but they do a workout are they stimulating it just from the workout or does the dietary piece have to be part of it? We know that if you do a fasted state and you do resistance exercise, you can stimulate protein synthesis. Um, you won't be able to get hypertrophy. It'd be a momentary effect. So it's a, you're triggering mechanisms, but it's not going to go anywhere. Um, I'm not a big fan of fasting. I routinely tell people that, you know, no one over the age of 50 should ever fast because you're going to lose muscle mass in fasting. Uh, and you, unless you really do a lot of resistance exercise when you come out, that's a permanent loss. So I don't think anybody over the age of 50 should ever fast. If you want to do time-restricted feeding, I think that's fine. Uh, but I don't think anyone over 50 should ever fast more than 36 hours. Another example of that is that you can take a fasted person and give them just leucine, and it will stimulate muscle protein synthesis, but it won't go anywhere. You'll turn on all the mechanisms. You can detect that the, the process started, but now you don't have the substrate. You don't have the amino acids to let it go anywhere. You can't really make anything. So, uh, you know, you can... You can trigger those processes, exercise or leucine, both can trigger it, but you need the complete amino acid mix. And if you just give amino acids, you're going to burn some of those amino acids for energy. So you just as well give some carb or fat along with it because you don't want to waste all the amino acids on generating your ATP. So that's why we always do blended meals. That's why we have a meal replacement shake that has carbs and fat in it. Because just giving protein, it's kind of a waste of protein. Got it. That makes a lot of sense. So it's combining the two stimulus is ideal, plus having the three different macros. So you're not drawing upon the protein and utilizing that in a different means than you'd ideally want to. Exactly. So, and you can make your choice between fat and carbs as to whatever philosophy you want to follow. I like a blend of the two. Um, you know, I'm, I'm about being low energy, low calories. And so I tend to restrict both carbs and fat in the diet. I'm not, I'm not a, a, a zealot about being high in fat or high in carbs or whatever. I, I want to balance. And I do, I do intense exercise. I do, you know, singles tennis. And so carbs are important to me. If I don't have enough carbs, I don't feel well. I can't compete well. Um, you know, because it's I'm above that threshold of 65% VO2 max, and so 
I am burning carbs at, you know, when I'm exercising. So I need to replace them. That's the way I like to look at carbs too. Like take them in, but then use them, have a purpose for them. Exactly. It's all about an exercise there. Like I said, there's the minimum amount your brain and your red blood cells need there. You need at least a hundred grams per day. And if you're not getting it from eating it, you got to get it from protein. You got to convert the protein into it. So you just want to eat them. <laughs> and it's much more fun. <laughs> but then, you know, if I'm going to do the exercise, I'm going to feel better with the carbs. And so I'm earning it. You know, if I put in an hour and a half or two hours of exercise, I've earned my extra 100 calories of carbohydrates. And I like it. I agree. You got to have the baseline, but earning it. I like that way of putting it. Don really enjoyed this conversation. Really unique topic for the show. And, and we went into all the weeds and the details. And this is going to be really helpful for a lot of people. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I thank you for your work. We're going to link up your website, your social media, everything in the show notes. And again, I just want to thank you for coming on the show. This has been fun. It was great fun. I hope we didn't confuse everybody as we got into the weeds, but hopefully we kept it sort of sensible. I'm all about, in fact, when we first uh, did our research diets at the University of Illinois, we called them the sensible solution. And so I'm all about moderation, trying to get things right. And I, I'm not about extremes at all. Well, I think we did a good job there where the practical, we've kept that part simple, but for people that want to understand the mechanisms, we went there too. So this was great. Thank you again. And uh, we'll be in touch. Enjoy it, Jesse. Thank you. Now that you're done my conversation with Dawn, you're going to want to stick around here and catch my chat with Dr. Gabrielle Lyon. She's got a lot more to share about protein and building muscle. I'll see you over there. People say they don't have time. And the reality is if you don't have time for fitness, then how do you think you're going to have time for sickness? I think that we have a muscle crisis. Not